All right, so in this second study, the trick is to play a legato melody in fingers five, four, maybe three, and maintain an articulated staccato bass line. Something like that. And have to do it together. So, for instance, the very first beat that can be tricky so I would recommend if this is not easy to do to do this basically separate those two things in time first play the sustained note and then work on articulating the staccato note Eventually, if you do it calmly, what you will end up being able to do is have a very small gap in time between those two things. So you press the long, the sustained note, and then quickly afterwards you press and release, uh, play in a staccato way, the accompanimental bass note. Before you know it, your fingers will have enough control over them to actually play it together. Well, that's, that's the key to playing this etude correctly. This ability to sustain the notes and not sustain the notes in the same time. So, going through the positions necessary for playing this correctly, I would say that you see the instant uh, in the very beginning where you have to jump. You don't have to do much, you just bring the thumb across from F to A, so that's reasonably easy. But it's only going to work if you already pre-position the second finger on C. It should naturally go there, but you know, you might start like that. That's obviously wrong. Now, the fourth finger, which is about to play F, if your hand is large enough, you could do this. And that way, all you have to worry about is the thumb. If you find the stretch is too big and your fourth finger naturally rests on E, that's okay you simply make sure to move both the thumb over to A and the fourth finger over to F right after the first downbeat. Right, and that takes care of everything up to beat four of this first measure. Now on beat four, a couple of things happen. Firstly, you might notice that I release the F in the melody, finger four, as soon as I play the staccato uh, accompaniment on beat four. You might say, well, why do you do that? Surely it should be that. And perhaps you might be correct. However, for many, many generations of musicians starting as far back as probably the early Baroque days, whenever you would see these pairs of slurred notes, first note, second note, the second note was always played shorter. So it would be quite appropriate, stylistically speaking, to let go of F as soon as you play the staccato uh, accompaniment on beat four. Uh, and that's what I intend here, since I am the composer of this etude. Now, if you're going to let go of finger four and, of course, of fingers one and two, that's the moment, the letting go moment is the moment to change position. And the next position is, of course, this. One on G, 
3 on F, 5 on A. So whereas we started with 1, 2, 5, F, C, G, and that was our first position, without any specific place to put finger 3. Uh, we're not using it in the first measure, we're not using it until that second measure. Well, I would recommend therefore to put finger 3 right around the E flat so that it rests on E. That way when time comes to reposition for measure 2 it's much easier to shift from this position into this position, right? So in fact you'll notice that in the second measure second finger doesn't play. So where would you put that finger? I'm not sure it seems to naturally rest on the D, right? So I would probably just do that. And when the time comes, we'll end up moving into a completely different position for measure three. But for right now, that's the entirety of the first measure. Start in the right position, bring the, the, the first finger across from F to A, Keep the fourth finger on F, if at all possible, and on beat four, prepare this position. I find that being very focused on the kinds of thing, problems you have to solve to play a particular piece uh, helps you to learn it better. So by saying my focus is this one measure and nothing else, that allows you to kind of work through these things that thing and as well as the thing of holding the G letting go of the staccato F and then at the end of the measure to execute this jump because if you're not doing either one of those things calmly and in with control chances are little errors will accumulate to the point where it's hard to maintain smooth easy flow through all of the measures. So here we go. So very similar measure, measure two, just different notes, different fingers, but same idea. Now we get to measure three. So beat four of the second measure is, is crucial because look what happens. Yeah, that's a very important move. It's not really about changing positions as much as it is about sliding inside the keyboard. So you are changing the position, you're not really changing the arrangement of your fingers above specific keys. The, the, the keys, I mean, only the thumb has to go over B flat there. But other than that, the main move is bring the hand sufficiently deep uh, deeply inside the keyboard so that the thumb is resting on top of B flat. That's the move. So that would be the focus for measure two. Once you're there, measure three is quite straightforward. All right, same idea. Now you wait till B two to move the thumb. And again, you're, you're observing the fact that the second finger stays put, sustaining the E. Now, because it's such a new toe and not a, a slur connecting E to D, you're quite welcome to let go of E before you strike D. Oops, completely messed that up. But yeah. Now, the gap is extremely small because that's slurred, that's connected. That's not connected, but almost sustained all the way to beat four on that D. Either way you do it is really okay with me. But what's important is that on beat four, this move occurs. Now, we played uh, the thumb on the B flat inside the keyboard 
in beat four you will be uh, sorry in measure four beat four you will be playing the thumb on d sharp here also on the black key so it kind of makes sense to keep your position inside the keyboard right there is that d coming up we're still playing it inside the keyboard and then you move over like this you're not trying to go here to the edge of the keys you're still inside the keys and that way it makes it very very easy to reposition the thumb over to d sharp one more time All right so if you if you don't move the thumb right over it might, might be a little tricky to do it in the last second oh i just realized i'm completely i'm using completely wrong fingers all right scrap the last minute or so so that can ha sometimes happen and if that happens i like to put a big fat three on top of that f just to remind myself not to screw up again now i cannot uh, uh, edit fingers within this view so i'll have to do this give me a quick second do that and now there is three right on top of this now i go back to the other view okay here is my three all right so with this three that rubato simply means take a little more time play around with these staccato gestures okay next line starting with measure five we have well an interesting kind of position e to play it next to the the black key is okay but you'll find that the fourth finger which is coming up for measure six kind of feels stuck around the C sharp so it's probably a good idea to move back out where you're playing the thumb on the on the edge second finger is just on the edge of the black key and the fourth finger is co as comfortably as is possible in this stretch resting on D so measure five same thing occurs right away as soon as I play the downbeat the thumb moves underneath my hand, ready to play the A. Right, I'm stuck on that third beat G sharp. I'm checking that my position is absolutely in the right place. In other words, don't do that. Right, one more time. If I see that, I know I can go on. But as soon as I go on and I play the downbeat of measure six, what happens is I need to do another little adjustment. So here's G sharp, right? You can barely see it. And then as soon as I play the downbeat of measure six, quite a bit of a readjustment. Now, not a huge one. It's really only the thumb that has to move. But, oh, uh, f forgive me the thumb and the second finger that has to move that have to move uh, the other fingers three four five stay in place right and that takes care of the rest of measure six uh, and we get to measure seven and there same thing will happen we will have to move as soon as we play the downbeat so holding the c in measure six getting ready to play beat one of measure seven and instantly jumping one more time i'm holding the c and i'm getting ready to jump notice i'm only worrying about jumping so that the third finger is on d first and second finger is on g and b so i can comfortably play beats two and three of this measure I'm not worried about finger four or five and the reason is that unless I have huge hands with long fingers where I can very comfortably stretch that which you can see I'm kind of struggling um, it 
doesn't make sense to put su such a strain on your hand. So just wait to, to move to these other notes for later, for right now. Hold that C, finger three. You're about to play the downbeat of seven. See, I now try to stretch my finger five a little further. That's fine. I can put it on the F, I can put it on G. I just wouldn't stretch as far as, as the A. One more time. Holding the C, getting ready to do the jump. That's what, that's what I would do. Just move enough to prepare GBD there. And then beat, th beat two of measure seven, three, play staccato. And since I already mentioned this idea of letting go of sustained notes a little earlier, you could apply the same principle here. You could pull the D and as soon as you play the staccato on B3, do the move. Yeah. Now, if you really want to sustain it a little bit further, you would still do the move, but you're still sustaining, you're still maintaining the contact with the key, the D, and uh, holding it beyond the staccato. But in this case, since it's not a slurred note, or you know, it's not a note that's slurred connection to the next note, you're absolutely fine to just let go of that D. And then do this move, which I think is the trickiest position shift so far, where from D, you have to, and D, G, B, yeah, on the edges of the white keys, you have to go back inside the keys and make sure to rest the thumb on the B flat that's coming up in measure eight. Of course, the other fingers are ready as well. It's D flat, E, F, and then finally we have that A prepared by uh, finger five, kind of pointing at roughly two o'clock. Now, same thing, you can use that third beat when you're playing B flat C E as a way to just let go of that long sustained A and reposition back out like this to be ready for the last beat of measure eight into measure nine. Yeah, so that's so two tricky position shifts from the third beat of measure seven to practice that and from the third beat of measure eight back out like this. And then we get into measure nine, uh, 10, 11, 12, and you can see uh, that it's identical to measure one, two, three, measures one, two, three, four. Only the last measure in this line is slightly different. So that's the only one I'll talk about. All that's happening there is the thumb takes its time to go through these staccato bass notes. And again, rubato is your friend. Now, here you very specifically see my sustained uh, A natural note in the melody connecting all the way to E natural in the bass. So sustain all the way to the fourth beat. Which means that as soon as you strike the E on the fourth beat, you use that moment to reposition for measure 13. Now, measure 13, I did not specifically finger uh, the melody notes there because there are two options. And one option is to pr prepare with two and four, something like that. I uh, seem to have some jittery action in my right side camera, um, but 
while it's possible, another perfectly reasonable solution is to place finger three on G and finger five on B flat. That kind of allows you to prepare, um, you know, those first two measures of the line quite comfortably uh, with the long fingers. And then really it's just the thumb that has to do some moving around. But the problem is that three and five are a little weak. So if you feel a little bit uncomfortable to articulate three and five like this, that the solution to play it with two and four is perfectly reasonable. But then you have to kind of step across F sharp with finger two to get all the way down to where you're trying to get to. So either way you do it, be aware of the necessary position shifts. I'll do it both ways and you can observe my hand. So with two and four on uh, G and B flat, instantly move in the thumb to D as soon as I play E flat on, B th on downbeat of 13. When I get to downbeat of uh, 14, again, instantly move in the thumb to D flat. And on B2 will be tricky as well because I instantly have to reposition from this configuration with fingers two and four to this configuration. So mm, let's do it in, in context. Right, so something like this. Uh, you can review it if you want uh, by um, pressing back on the video uh, or the other solution with three and five still move the thumb down to d keep moving down to b uh, the d flat but notice i don't have to worry about my long fingers at all keep moving down to c and now finally on the downbeat of 15 is where the big shift down occurs and that's what you really have to practice and notice i'm making sure to keep the thumb inside my whole hand inside the keys so that the thumb is playing at b border of blacks and whites so it's very easy to do this now let's see what's on that final measure there yeah so you can see the first time I would be playing the, the big note heads, the regular sized note heads. When I come back to play this passage at the end of the piece, I will be playing the small sized note heads. Okay, but for right now, the big ones. Now, same thing. As soon as I hit G sharp, that third finger holding the F in the melody, let's go. Holding the F, playing the second beat. Now about to play the third beat. Guess what's about to happen? Yep. Huge jump. This could be one spot where looking down at your hand and checking that you landed correctly might be wise. Most of everything I wrote in these studies allows you to keep reading the score and find the positions by feel. But While you can absolutely find it by feel, and the way I do it with my hand is by using the senses or tactile sensations in my fingertips. I know that third and fourth fingers are in the right place because, hey, here's that gap between E flat and G flat. That gap is, of course, E and F. Let's say I, I did something like this. Well, I instantly know I'm not in the right spot because that third and fourth fingers, they are on two closely positioned black keys. I'm not even looking down at my hand right now. It's the second finger that I'm feeling that gap with. Well, I can quickly readjust, right? So again, I know I'm in the wrong place because three and four, they're sort of stuck between two closely positioned black keys. So, well, I can think that 
that might be my gap but I also know I didn't jump very far so most likely that gap is where I need to be yeah so there are ways to absolutely teach yourself to jump wide distances without ever looking down and still finding the right positions but why not take a peek there we have it there there is where we need to be and so we continue uh, in for the B section right this one after the word fine we get into measure 17 and play the B section and let's check out what's going on whoops measure 18 and look where our thumb is right so that's another a, a good um, consideration why not start like this makes it so much easier well some of you might say yeah but it's so uncomfortable to play deep inside the keys why can't I do this instead of playing all of it inside start like this on the edge and then once I'm past measure 17 start sliding in gradually and you're absolutely right that's a perfectly reasonable solution as well it's just that for me if I know there is trouble and I need to master it to feel in control of what I'm playing I like to just go for it right away unless it's really hurting me or it's something that there is no reason to torture myself with if I need to be able to play inside the keys in measures 18 anyway why not practice playing with the same feel in measure 17 that way I have I can avoid that slide in action during measure 17 so that that's my logic but if you are comfortable to do that sort of position readjustment in the middle between those two measures that's fine but I will I will choose my way now for measure 19 I think you'll find it much easier to play back out on the edge because of how wide this chord ends up being if you can do it this way and not feel ooh, this is really tough you probably have a huge hand bigger than mine but if you have smaller hand than mine or not bigger than mine hand uh, then just slide back out right here I will use the third beat of measure 18 as the moment to readjust my position like this but we finally need to play back inside the keys because of the F sharp with finger one in measure what's measure 20 20 so then you might say to me look you're having you know to do the sliding in action anyway I'm going to practice doing that starting with the uh, uh, measure 17 right in out in out and again you might win this argument but I might still do this so my overfeel of this phrase ends up being playing inside the keyboard for just one moment in measure 19 anyway piano is not always straightforward you have pros and cons for any solution now into 21 back into this stretch that we had in measure 19 right G C E A so we are preparing that stretch before the fourth beat of measure 20 so now I know I'm ready to play everything except of course I have to move finger um, finger 5 from A to G now how would you do a legato you either don't and it's just this idealized legato that try to play it smoothly or you do the illegal use of the pedal because of course the piece says no pedal but what it's really saying is don't play like this 
I'm sorry, there, here's my pedal. You can see it light up in green. Right, I'm saying don't pedal through the staccato notes. For this one moment where you see um, the slur, which is impossible to execute with one finger, of course you can come down like this. And then release right away and you've got the perfect legato. So yeah, uh, that's how I would approach this little moment. Prepare this position, press the pedal as you play the A, move the, G, move the fifth finger from A to G, get that ready, one, two, three is all, one, two, three are already ready. Let go of the pedal as soon as you play the G on the downbeat of 21 and just continue. Now, beat three of 21, another huge shift inside the keyboard. So kind of like we had back in, uh, where are we? Yes, in measure two, uh, no, not two. Sorry, I'm being a little bit confused. There it is. Uh, from measure seven, third beat, we had, you know, this nasty little diagonal move. Now in 21, two, yeah, 21 into two. When we get to the third beat of 21, we're holding the G, we're playing the second beat. Now second, the third beat will launch us way up into, you'll see. Okay, that was not very secure. G is held down. Again, you might want to peek down or maybe what I like to um, encourage people to do is recognize that the D flat is right next to finger two. In your mind, you have a kind of mental map of the space that you are occupying. And the space is that even without looking, cl closing my eyes, I know that I can find a D flat without looking with finger one because that's where the second finger was, right? And then placing the other fingers is just a matter of teaching them to feel these other black keys and realizing that, okay, this big gap for finger two means here is the F. Yeah, it's easy to find by feel. Well, over the hump of the F sharp will be the place for the third finger, um, which G, and then fourth finger can rest on, um, first on A and then it'll find B flat afterwards. So that, um, configuration that you see on the screen is what you need to practice. So you've got the G uh, held down on downbeat of 21, you're holding it, you're playing those two accompaniment chords, beat two and beat three, you're telling yourself I'm about to do the move. One more time, you're holding the G, you're about to, to play beat three and then you move. So that kind of has to become an automatic move to play this uh, transition smoothly. Then beat four into beat one of measure 22, right? And it's very easy, I'm already in position. By this point, as soon as you play beat one, look at finger four. Should it really be on A? No, it should be right here. So I would practice doing that little adjustment. I just kind of make it a habit to lift it out of the depths of A natural and put it right away on B flat. Now you noticed from B3, that's my adjustment. Not doing anything else. I could try to move my finger five out a little bit more towards the D, but more importantly, it's these. Really fingers one, two, and three. Now three doesn't have to play anything, but you have to get it out of the way for two to place itself upon the G. Just like that. Then you're ready to continue. Right, that big roll there. I will forgive somebody if they would love to add a little bit of a pedal there. But for me, I feel like 
adding this obvious pedal takes away from the scherzo nature of this staccato piece. So I personally would not. But of course I cannot control performers, so if you do it, it's up to you. Same thing you noticed. When I slur from B flat to G, I'm not going to hold G all the way down to the roll. I'm going to let go a little earlier because it's the second note under the slurred pair. Mm -hmm. Now, when I get to the top of my roll, you'll notice that there is a slight adjustment of my finger one to make sure it's resting on D. I'm not worrying about anything else. I've got rubato, I can take my time. As soon as I let go of the D and play the, uh, the top D and start playing uh, the bottom D with finger one, that's the move. So that's very important. So as you play beat four, that's when you uh, do this interesting position shift. You go to D with one, of course, it's already there, but four is on E flat, um, three is on D flat, and two is on B natural. So then, as you go into beat one of measure 24, that's what happens, right? So the second, uh, second finger stays put, first finger swings right out. You practice holding the E flat, not letting go, playing the D flat, but notice what the problem is. That's right, that has to be here. So same thing, the position changes almost every beat. You go here, beat four on off measure 23. As soon as you play the downbeat of 24, you do this. And then as soon as you play the second beat of measure 24, you do this. Right, big stretch over to E and B flat. Then you play the D flat. And then as you play the D flat, you have the writ to take, uh, uh, you know, take as much time as you need. You stretch as far as you can to get that fifth finger up above the F sharp, or at least as close to it as possible. Which means that the third finger, look how far inside the keyboard it slides down. Yeah, it's almost at the full board, which I've removed just so that the video is easier to shoot otherwise I would have a little <laughs> cover like this but you'll be right up against the full board of your piano and the th thumb is right here or you know wherever it can be and then you finally pr play this last beat of measure 24. Now if your if your hand is a little smaller you might do something like that a little break just to play the staccato and then get to that F sharp. And then reposition before you start DS Alfine. Okay, let's go back to DS measure nine. Reposition before you do it. Now, second time it's piano, so nice and quiet. Reposition. Check your positions all the time when you're practicing until they become automatic. inside the keys. Keep staying inside the keyboard. Now, shift. As soon as I play that E, I want to, let's go to 3-5 solution. All right, so 1-3-5 here. measure you play the little notes a stretch as far as you can you might even end up pressing the E natural halfway down with finger three just so you can stretch over to the bottom F there and that's okay because oftentimes 
you do have to do these kind of half presses. You know, I don't know, f some situations where you kind of have to slide around on the keyboard and some keys end up being half pressed, but who cares? If, the, if they're not making any sounds, it's not uh, creating any musical problems. So uh, be aware of that that's a solution. <laughs> Well, uh, hopefully this video helps to practice this second etude. Uh, stay tuned for number three.